but I am a full-time paid employee at Neurocrine Biosciences, and in the past, I worked as an adult epilepsy specialist at the University of Cincinnati. Also, prior to joining Neurocrine, I do need to disclose that I served on speakers, bureaus, and advisory boards for three companies, Asai, Levanova, and UCB. In addition, in the past, prior to joining Neurocrine, I have received research support from the pharmaceutical company Xenon Pharmaceuticals. Being able to give this talk is certainly something I've very much looked forward to because I very much look forward to the chance to talking about Neurocrine. It's a company that has been around now for three decades and has a legacy of delivering on hope. As the name implies, it's a neuroscience-based biopharmaceutical company that has particular expertise and products within the neurology and endocrinology sphere. However, we're also expanding to look at medications that may also have psychiatric indications. What is really impressive about this company and the reason why I joined back in March is that they have a focus on discovering novel treatments, but not just for diseases that lots of people have, but where there is a true significant unmet clinical need. And that includes looking at therapies that may deliver hope for patients and caregivers for diseases that are very rare to the point where these individuals feel invisible, unheard, and potentially even marginalized. When it comes to our company, we have four products that are commercially available right now. We're most known for Ingresa or Valbenazine, which is a medication that is approved for tardive dyskinesia. Excuse me. We also have a medication, Agentis, that is approved for Parkinson's disease. As the CRIN in Neurocrin implies, we also have two medications that have endocrinology uses. We have a medication for endometriosis, as well as one for uterine fibroids. On the endocrinology side of things, we aren't, we are not satisfied with just those two indications. We have products that we're looking at in both congenital adrenal hyperplasia in adults and children, as well as polycystic ovarian syndrome. As I hinted on in the last slide, we have medications that we're looking at in the psychiatric sphere, specifically one looking at cognitive impairment associated with schizophrenia and other ones looking at anhedonia and depression and the treatment of major depressive disorder. What's most dear to my heart as an adult epilepsy specialist is we have multiple medications in the neurology sphere. We continue to look at valbenicine and look at additional indications, including Korea and Huntington's disease. We have molecules that we're looking at in a central tremor, and we're also studying various epilepsies. In addition to focal onset seizures in adults and a rare pediatric epilepsy called SCN8A, demodal and epileptic encephalopathy, we have a T-type calcium channel blocker that we're exploring in CSWS. I will explore that in quite a bit more detail because of the potential connections with autism in a bit. To sort of preface our talk on the connections between epilepsy and autism, I think it's good to take a step back for, for some of you in the audience and really get a deep dive into what seizures and epilepsy actually are. A seizure is the manifestation of a sudden surge of uncontrolled electrical activity in the brain that can cause temporary changes in movement, behavior, sensation, or even the level of consciousness. Depending on where seizures evolve in the brain, they can have different symptoms and have different terminology assigned to them as well. For seizures that are confined or begin in one part of the brain, the term that we use now is focal onset. We used to call those partial onset seizures. Based on where in the brain these focal onset seizures start, the symptoms that may manifest can include things like a brief lapse of attention, involuntary movement of a part of the body, or some combination thereof. Seizures can also be generalized in onset, where if you're recording with EEGs or electrodes on the scalp, you can see the electrical activity all over. When those types of seizures are brief and involve brief lapses of attention, we often refer to them as absent seizures. In addition, both focal onset and generalized seizures, if they spread to involve enough networks, can go into prolonged convulsions of the entire body. We call those generalized tonic-clonic seizures, or sometimes they're also referred to as grand mal seizures. Now, seizures and epilepsy are not necessarily the same thing. To have a diagnosis of epilepsy, you either have to have two or more unprovoked seizures, meaning seizures that are not provoked by something like drug use, et cetera, that are at least 24 hours apart. However, you can also carry a diagnosis of epilepsy even after a single unprovoked seizure. However, to get the diagnosis of epilepsy after only one seizure, you have to have some enduring predisposition of the brain to future seizures uncovered on testing. For instance, if after your first seizure, you had an MRI or a scan of the brain that showed a lesion that's very much associated with the risk of seizures, you could be diagnosed with epilepsy. When taken in total, we're talking about a disorder with a huge global impact. It is thought to affect over 65 million people worldwide. If you look just here in the United States, there's also a large burden of disease. 
slightly over 1% of the U.S. population is thought to have active epilepsy. That means that they're either receiving one or more seizure drugs currently, either they've had a seizure or more in the past year or some combination of those two factors. This accounts for roughly 3.4 million people in the United States. That can be divided into roughly 3 million adults and 470,000 children. Even in just the state of California alone, if you look at CDC data back from 2015, it was estimated that over 427,000 individuals had active epilepsy. That number has unfortunately likely grown since those numbers came out in 2015. Now, when it comes to the connections that exist between autism spectrum disorder and epilepsy, this is something that we've actually known about for quite some time. It even dates back to the 1940s and some of the first case studies in autism spectrum disorder that were published by child psychiatrist Leo Kanner. When looking at his 1943 case study that involved a total of 11 children, eight boys and three girls, he noted one that had characteristics that were very clearly epilepsy. If you look at children and adults who have autism spectrum disorder and you look at the prevalence of epilepsy, it can vary widely depending on the particular study that you read. If you look at clinic-based studies, you can actually see some rates that are as high as 50%. However, to be honest with you, those are likely very overrepresented in that particular tertiary referral type center. What may be better and avoids that bias is to actually look at population-based studies. If you do so and you look at meta-analysis, the pool prevalence of epilepsy and autism spectrum disorder is still high. It very much has an impact or is impacted by whether the person also has intellectual disability. If you take someone with autism spectrum disorder who has comorbid intellectual disability, you can see that roughly a quarter of those individuals will have comorbid epilepsy. However, even individuals with autism spectrum disorder and who lack intellectual disability still have a higher rate of epilepsy than the general population based on meta-analysis of population-based studies that's estimated to be around 8 to slightly less than 9%. In addition, when looking at the prevalence of epilepsy and autism spectrum disorder, age definitely plays an influence. If you look at younger children, for instance, those who are less than 13 years of age, you can see that the prevalence of comorbid epilepsy is around 10% or less. However, if you look at the graph on the right-hand side, what you can see as time goes on is that that prevalence continues to increase. And by the time you get to adolescence in patients with autism spectrum disorder, the prevalence of comorbid epilepsy can be upwards of over a quarter or 26.2%. As before, having comorbid epilepsy increases the risk of having comorbid cognitive deficits, in addition, when EEG studies are done, when we look for electrical activity and look for abnormal electrical activity in the brain, we see a predilection for that abnormal electrical activity over the bilateral frontal lobes. However, once again, as I emphasized on the last slide, even in, in children and adults with autism spectrum disorder who have normal intellect, there still exists an increased risk of epilepsy versus people who do not have ASD. Now, if you flip it around and you ask, well, what is the prevalence of autism spectrum disorder in people with epilepsy, we not shockingly find a similar association. For instance, in this population-based cohort of over 64,000 people of epilepsy, what they found is that the odds of having ASD versus the general population was upwards of slightly over 22 times. That accounts for about 4 to 5% of children with epilepsy who have a comorbid autism spectrum disorder. Having seizure onset in an earlier or younger age is associated with a higher risk, not only of ASD, but the risk of developing cognitive impairment, just like it was when you had ASD. Now, one of the tests that we use to look for potential for epileptic seizures to work up our patients is an EEG, a test where we actually put stickers or electrodes on the scalp for a brief period of time to look at the underlying brain waves. And what we're specifically looking for there as epilepsy specialists are these split-second discharges called epileptiform discharges, which you can think of as abnormal electricity that isn't necessarily a seizure itself, but can potentially suggest a predisposition of the brain to seizures. If you were to take all children, all comers, who didn't have any disease, who didn't have any suggestive epilepsy, who didn't have any suggestive autism spectrum disorder, and you were to randomly do EEGs on them, what you would see is that a very, very small percentage, less than a percentage, only 0.5%, would actually have these abnormal interictal spikes or epileptiform activity on their EEG. However, if you do those same EEGs in children who have autism spectrum disorder, what you see is that the majority, 
up to 60% actually have abnormal interictal spikes at some point during their recorded EEG. In addition, not all of these patients have a history, a definitive clinical history of accompanied seizures as well. As I mentioned on one of the previous slides, when we do EEGs in children with autism spectrum disorder and we see these discharges, they seem to have a particular predilection for affecting the frontal lobes. Now, you're probably asking yourself, why is it that these two disease entities have such a connection with each other? Well, the reason is because both entities share this altered excitatory inhibitory balance. When it comes to epileptic seizures, the reason why people have epileptic seizures is because they have excessively synchronous and sustained firing of neurons. But this same imbalance between excitation and inhibition that underlies the development of seizures may also influence the development of autism spectrum disorder. This has been suggested by early life studies in rodents where those rodents are actually treated with medications that cause seizures at postnatal days five to 14. What we notice when you cause seizures in those rodents early in their life is that you have this persistent increase in neocortical excitation that occurs, but you also have this decrease in GABA currents, which are a key inhibitory current that exists in the brain. And when you have this imbalance where you have too much excitation and you have too little inhibition, what you get is an increase in something called short-term plasticity at a place in the brain called the mesial prefrontal cortex. You can think of short-term plasticity as the synaptic efficacy that changes over time in a way that actually reflects the history of activity that's been occurring pre-synaptically. And what happens is when you have that increased short-term plasticity as a result of the imbalance between excitation and inhibition, is you have an increase in something called coherence that results in overconnectivity. This is shown by the fact that if you look at these rats with early life seizures, you see these highly coherent waveforms that appear in the dorsal hippocampus, the ventral hippocampus, and the prefrontal cortex. What that results in, though, in these rodents is things like impaired sociability and behavioral inflexibility, behaviors that you may also see in people who have autism spectrum disorder. And this helps to link them two together, suggesting that enhanced coherences across a broad span of frequencies may actually be what is resulting in this risk of behavior that approximate autism spectrum disorder. Now, when it comes to, to patients, human patients who have both autism spectrum disorder and epilepsy, I would be remiss if I didn't spend some time talking about tuberous sclerosis complex or TSC for short. This is a very key epilepsy syndrome with a very high rate of comorbid autism spectrum disorders. It's actually a genetic disorder, an autosomal dominant disorder where the majority of cases are characterized by mutations in one of two genes, either the TSC1 gene, which codes for Hamerton, or the TSC2 gene, which codes for tuberin. What happens when you have a mutation in these genes is you actually have the development of what are called hamartomas, or these tumor-like lesions. You can see these in multiple organ systems. These include not only the brain, but also other organ systems like the skin, the kidneys, the heart, the eyes, and the lungs. The problem is, is that these proteins inhibit something naturally, or they should, something called the serine threonine protein kinase, the million target of rapamycin, or what is abbreviated as mTOR for short. This mTOR, mTOR kinase complex is something that is a central component of the cell growth pathway. It responds to changes in nutrients, energy balances, and extracellular signals to control normal cellular processes. What happens normally is that Hamerton and tuberin, if they're present, should form a functional complex that actually inhibits mTOR. But when you have the loss of function of either TSC1 or TSC2, what you get is you get this protein complex that's, that results in deregulated and constitutively active mTOR complex, and you get this constant cell growth that results in the tumor formation. The problem is, though, there's also protein synthesis that is regulated by this mTOR signaling pathway. And those proteins play a key role in learning associated synaptic changes. And so what happens in TSE is you have this increased local availability of proteins because of one of these two mutations that may lead to stability of the plasticity of synapses that would not normally undergo synaptic consolidation. And what you see as a net result of that is to actually increase the signal to noise ratio and to degrade the specificity of synaptic modifications that occur during normal learning. As a consequence of this, what we see in patients is a very high risk of intractable epilepsy. This can present very early in life and can even present with things like infantile spasms.
In addition, you have a definite risk in these patients of seeing cognitive disabilities. These can range from mild to severe, but you can also see behavioral disturbances. Roughly 40% of patients who, are who have a diagnosis of tuberous sclerosis complex are also subsequently diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. And probably not interesting after hearing the first portion of this talk, those who have early seizure onset are associated with a higher risk of subsequently developing an autism spectrum disorder. Interestingly too, the risk of developing an autism spectrum disorder in patients with TSC may actually be reduced with early successful treatment of seizures. We can see this both in animal models as well as human beings. If you take the TSC2 knockout mice for tuberous sclerosis complex and you use an mTOR inhibitor like rapamycin, what you see is that you get not only a reversal of the normal synaptic consolidation that occurs in this disorder, but you actually have a restoration of learning deficits. In humans, there was also a very interesting study that was done looking at a, an anti-seizure medicine called Vigabatrin. That is an anti-seizure drug which happens to be quite helpful in treating seizures that are associated with tuberous sclerosis complex in a lot of patients. They looked at children who were either treated early with Vigabatrin after they developed seizures or much later on with Vigabatrin after they initially developed seizures that were uncontrolled. What they saw is that if you treated children early with Vigabatrin, only 9% went on to develop autism spectrum disorder. That contrasts to the children who were treated much later where over half or 52% actually went on to develop autism spectrum disorder. Another entity just like tuberous sclerosis complex that's associated with a high concurrent risk of both epilepsy and autism is fragile X syndrome. This is actually the most common inherited form of intellectual disability in males. It occurs in roughly one out of every 4,000 males it's linked to mutations in the FM1R gene that codes for this particular protein reduced, or excuse me, it's called Fragile X Mental Retardation 1 protein, or FMRP for short. This protein, kind of like the others that we saw before with tuberous sclerosis complex, is very much important in the regulation of the production of other proteins, but also in the development of synapses as well. And what we see in not only human beings, but also FMRP knockout mice, is a very high incidence of both epilepsy and autism spectrum disorder. They have impaired synaptic plasticity, they have alterations in the morphology of their dendrites, and they have neurocognitive deficits that lead to behavior that is very reminiscent of what we see in autism. Now, shifting gears a little bit, I wanna talk about another epilepsy disorder that can be associated with cognitive regression, behavioral changes, and a phenotype that can approximate autism. And that's EECSWS, or epileptic encephalopathy with continuous spike wave during sleep. This is a very rare pediatric epilepsy disorder. In studies that have been performed, it's actually thought to only account for about a half a percentage to one and a half percentage of children who have epilepsy. That accounts for maybe one to two per 100,000 children. It actually is a very unique disease entity where as children begin to develop symptoms like seizures as well as cognitive regression, if you perform an overnight EEG, you see a continuous pattern called electrical status epileptic as a sleep. I'll actually show you what that looks like on the next slide. Although it can begin in children anywhere between the ages of two to 12, it seems to have a predilection to having symptoms present typically by the ages of four to five years. As I promised on the left-hand side of the screen, you can actually see an example from a patient taken at nighttime. So what happens when these patients go to sleep is that you see sudden activation or remarkable increase in what are called spike wave discharges, where they become almost continuous for a time during sleep. For a lot of these patients, during certain stages of sleep, like the non-rapid eye movement or non-REM stage of sleep, you see this EEG pattern for at least half, if not sometimes 80 or more percent of the time. The problem is when you see this EEG pattern, it typically goes along with things like cognitive stagnation and even regression. That can lead to changes in learning, behavior, and brain development. It can lead to lower level of functioning or halted progress at school, and rarely can also be associated with things that look like late onset autistic regression. When it comes to why patients with EECSWS develop this EEG pattern and the resulting cognitive deficits that go along with it, a lot of thought revolves around the thalamic oscillatory circuit that you see pictured on the screen in front of you. This is a network of neurons that connect three very distinct parts of the brain the reticular thalamic nucleus, the thalamus, and the cortex. 
you can think of the thalamus as sort of this direct connectivity to many parts of the brain that acts as a gatekeeper or a relay station for information processing. Importantly, the thalamic oscillatory circuit is felt to be very important in the formation of normal sleep. When it comes to the thalamic oscillatory circuit, one of the things that is most critical to maintaining it, as well as neuronal function, is the ion calcium. And this helps to regulate all of the neurons that you see within this particular circuit. Now, T-type calcium channel proteins are the ones that are expressed widely in the cell membranes of the neurons that are part of this particular circuitry. They're foundational in creating the electrical signals that these particular neurons use to communicate with one another. There are three different types of T-type calcium channels that you see in the thalamic oscillatory circuit. They're the CAV 3.1, 3.2, and 3.3 channels. Any subtle modification in these types of channels can affect how the neurons within this oscillatory circuit work and are thought to actually play a role in the development of a different seizure type known as absent seizures. With these, patients will develop these brief episodes where they will lose consciousness, will be noted to stare, and then may have other very subtle signs like eye blinking before they come to, but have no memory of what has just preceded it during the seizure. If you record an EEG during absent seizures, what you'll see is those same spike and wave complexes, like what I showed you in the previous EEG that was replete throughout the night of somebody with EECSWS, you just see them during wakefulness and for much shorter periods of time, say three to 10 or so seconds. In addition to CSWS, there is a related condition that I hinted at earlier called landau klesner syndrome or LKS. They're very similar. In fact, some consider them to actually be part of a continuous spectrum of childhood epilepsies and epileptic encephalopathies. This one has a similar age of onset. It's thought to develop between the ages of two to eight, although it seems to have a particular predilection for the age ranges of five to seven years. However, what this one is uniquely characterized by is a progressive loss of language ability. This is both expressive and receptive. In addition, it has a behavioral phenotype that may very well overlap with what you typically see with autistic regression. You see attention deficit disorders in roughly 80% of patients with LKS. You see other types of seizures like focal motor seizures, absent seizures, atypical absence, and atonic seizures in roughly 75%. And once again, just like with CSWS, when you look at the overnight EEG in these patients, you see epileptiform activity, particularly over the posterior temporal head regions, that can become much more widespread, intense, and almost continuous during non-REM sleep. When we discuss EECSWS and LKS, what, what, if I impress upon anything upon you, it's that delayed diagnosis unfortunately results in worse outcomes. The problem with this disorder is because the symptoms can be so subtle and because not all patients with this disorder develop obvious clinical seizures like brand mal or generalized tonic clonic seizures, the developmental and cognitive symptoms can sometimes be so subtle in the beginning that, and maybe the only sign is they can go undetected. To make the actual diagnosis of EECSWS and LKS, you, you typically need the assistance of either a pediatric neurologist or a pediatric epilepsy specialist because you have to perform an, an EEG that captures sleep and enough sleep where you can see a clear activation of these discharges during particular stages of sleep like non-REM sleep. As I alluded to at the top of this slide, delaying the diagnosis and having an adequate treatment and continuation of these spike wave discharges may very well lead to worse cognitive outcomes that unfortunately, if they persist beyond a certain amount of time, may persist into adulthood and be permanent. In addition, this is definitely a disease entity where an unmet need exists. There are currently no guidelines for treatments and no FDA approved treatments for this particular condition. When it comes to the treatment paradigms that clinicians are using right now, those are mostly based on uncontrolled studies and case studies. The goal of therapy at the moment is to suppress those abnormal EEG signals during sleep that I showed you earlier, improve controls of seizures if they're also present, things like the focal motor seizures, the tonic, the atonic, et cetera, and with the improvement in the EEG abnormalities, hopefully subsequently improve cognitive function. Although, as I mentioned, we have no approved treatments, the treatments that are used by and large for this condition include seizure medications that are approved for other seizure types, particularly high-dose benzodiazepines. High-dose corticosteroids are also utilized, as is IVIG. Rarely focal lesions, for instance, in the thalamus may be present that may be amenable to surgical intervention. In addition, like with many of our intractable epilepsies, we do have non-pharmacological therapies like the ketogenic diet that can be helpful. 
However, there is a great number of patients, unfortunately, who continue to have symptoms despite these available treatments, and that just stresses the need to evaluate further treatments and develop formal treatment guidelines. And with that, that's where neurocrine has really come into play, because we have a molecule NBI827104 that we're studying in this particular disorder. NBI827104 is an investigational, novel, orally available selective T-type calcium channel inhibitor. It effectively crosses the blood-brain barrier, so, you, so it reaches the neurons that are within that thalamic oscillatory circuit that we believe underlies CSWS. And it targets all three types of those T-type calcium channel blockers, the CAV1 or 3.1, 2, and 3 that I discussed earlier that are thought to be involved with this particular disorder. We feel that this drug may reduce or block the abnormal brain activity that's typical in patients with this particular disorder and the potential to be used in combination with anti-seizure medicines that are currently available to treat the underlying disorder. So right now we are studying this in children age 4 to 12 years of age. They have to be receiving stable doses of one to three other anti-seizure medicines to be eligible and have no other relevant neurologic disorders. Our trial consists of a 13-week study period where subjects are randomly assigned to either receive treatment, active drug, or placebo. And what we're looking at as our primary efficacy outcome is looking at the changes in this electrical status epilepticus and sleep pattern during the first hour of non-REM sleep. We're also looking at other measures of cognition and global impression of change as exploratory endpoints, but the EEG is the one that we're focusing on for this particular program. 